Aloha. Aloha. So, um, most, most people call me Drake. Uh, I do have a couple other names, but most people refer to me as Drake. Um, and so I'm here today. Malian invited me to come teach some Korean natural farming. Um, and I figured I would give you guys the most easy and available and approachable recipe so that you guys can go home and start this today if you want and begin improving your soil, your microorganisms in your area. But as the water is moving through your land, you're also going to start improving the ocean down below you and any of the produce that's grown there, um, these will, um, hopefully you will get healthier produce. And the function and reasoning behind that is this is a way to make microorganisms, um, but they're indigenous microorganisms. So they're what's right here. Um, and they're what has already made our earth pretty pristine before we started to kind of in the last hundred years or so, had, maybe 200 years, we really had kind of, a, um, since Pasteur decided that germs were bad, we kind of had this war on microbes, um, where instead of recognizing, you know, fermentation and things that have kept civilization alive for decades and, and you know, throughout time, we've now said all germs are bad and we put germ X on our hands as a, as a predominant society and we try to sterilize everything as our default kind of way to returning back to recognizing that pretty much 98% if not more of the microbes are actually good and beneficial for us. It's actually about 10 to 15% that are kind of um, what you would consider bad, but they're not bad, like something like candida. Is everyone familiar with candida? It's a, it's a microorganism that kind of gets in your body and can cause problems. And a lot of people try to counter that by reducing their sugar intake to, to counter candida. But candida is actually in you for a reason, so that when your cells are dying, the candida kind of eats those and cleans them out. And so candida itself isn't even bad. What is becomes bad is when it gets out of balance. So when you have so much candida in your other cells and, you know, the ones that are growing your cells, the candida is out-competing them and causing a, a dis-ease in your body, disease. So when I look at all microorganisms, even the most thug person has something genuine to offer to us and something that they can share in a way that, um, and, and, and you gotta understand, like, even someone, like, breaking something is an opportunity to maybe rebuild it better. Um, so, I, so I don't look at anything as bad. I'm looking at this as balance. And what helps to bring balance is two things. One of those is good people, good microbes. We can, like, good people can come in and help build balance, right? They can recognize resources. They can do all kinds of things. And the second part of that is abundant resources or abundant food. So if there's a whole abundant food, I don't have to come do violence to you to grab this food from you because there's so much that I don't have to express maybe this bad part of me. Like like if there was so much land and, and there was pigs everywhere, I don't have to come on your land and hunt, which might violate you in some way. Right? There's this abundant food everywhere. And so there's these two things, good people, good microbes, or tons of resources and plenty of food. And so I kind of approach it too strong of going and saying, okay, well, we're gonna make good microbes. We're gonna bring great leaders to this area. We're going to inspire them to be like top shelf leaders and bring the best out. But we're also gonna make sure they got really good food. So when they get there, it's like, you could have a bunch of leaders. Like imagine us, we all, all consider ourselves pretty decent people, but imagine we didn't have food for three, four days, how we'd interact with each other, right? And imagine, like, I, I walk by with a donut. You think you're just gonna let me walk by or someone's gonna try crack me with a rock and take the donut and be like, and then the other guy and crack that guy. You know, that donut, it's like all of a sudden it became like, oh, I don't eat donuts, so I'm gonna eat that donut. <laughs> So, 
So it's a balance. You gotta have food, you gotta have good people. And when you don't have enough food, the good people become less so good. And when you have too much food, the not so good people become good. So it's this balance both sides. So if you look at the handout, um, and in fact, mini book that I gave to you, I just printed this out as a mini book. And um, what it is, is um, it's the first, uh, and I may be out of them. It's okay. Okay. It's the first um, three pages of this larger ebook that I have on the internet. Um, and this ebook that I have here, it's um, right now I'm selling it for six dollars just for itself. And this gives you a complete all the recipes for. There's even more recipes than just these um, three that I gave you. Um, and this also has the application theory and all that other kind of stuff in here. Um, and but in my version of the book, I was just talking about this the other day. You see, there's all these handwritten notes, and I'm just about to release a new version of this. And so what I'm doing is selling the ebook for six dollars. But if you bought a fifty dollar one of it. That gives you free updates until, so anytime I update this book, you get the latest edition sent to you. So I was trying to figure out some small ways to make my farming and my teaching and all that more sustainable. And I think this information exchange is a way that makes it equitable for us all. My main goal as a Korean natural farmer teacher is to bring these concepts in a way that makes it palatable to our mindset and also in English. So I learned this from Korea, from several senseis, even a guy from the Philippines, um, an American scientist taught me how to use a microscope and become very adept to like get the scientific Western, like we want to know slice dice, is it really this? We got a test, we got data. And all that exists, and it's possible to do. But largely, I'm bringing this from an Eastern mindset, which is just trust the master, no ask questions. Chop the wood, carry the water, eventually you can reach enlightenment. He's not like, oh, well, first touch your mudra, and then sit like this. You know, it's like, no, chop the wood, carry the water, and you will get there. So I've chopped the wood, carried water, and come out with this information to try to share to you guys up with enough science that hopefully it keeps it entertaining and I also have two other books that I have that I'm in process of combining these three so that once I put larger font I think it'll be like I, larger font was my first uh, consideration because my mom started to read this she's like let me get my old lady glasses I was like okay larger font <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so trying trying to distill this information for you guys, and that's that's what um, that's been my mission. Um, and um, but today to plant some small seeds so that they can grow for you in your in any situation. So. Um, let's look through the recipes just real fast so we can yeah. see what we got. Um, this first one, I called it Ina A. Has anyone watched Idiocracy? It's, it's one of the best documentaries out there. You should definitely check it out. What's it called again? Idiocracy. It's, it's well worth it's well worth the like three forty to rent it off YouTube or whatever. However you do it, oh. it's a great documentary. Thank you. Um, but I kind of this 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 would be more funny after you watch that video because it's um they they essentially um go into the future and they forgot all the basics of what they're doing. And they try to do agriculture by spraying like Gatorade on their plants. Because they think, oh, electrolytes, that's what plants need, right? That's what, that's what we crave. And they forget about water and this agricultural stuff. So this is kind of a, a little joke on them that Aina Aid 
and it's this is what we can return to our soil. And so this is a recipe for doing indigenous microbes. The next one on here is this essentially free balanced nutrients. And this one is the first food. So my papers is going everywhere. I'll take those back. Thank you. So our essentially free balanced nutrients is this is a food. And this is like one of the cheapest, easiest ways you can take crop waste. Like this this grass right next to me right here. Most people look at that as like, oh that's one problem. I get all this grass. But this recipe, now you're looking at that and saying, oh, this is a resource. I gotta get more of this stuff growing because this is what's powering my system. And that's what this recipe enables you to do. Take something that's on problem, turn it into one solution that's gonna be some of the best, easy to get out there food for your land. Oh, look at this. When, yes. you, when you're saying micro-rich soil, do you have like something that you keep, like you've built up the soil pile or something and you use that? To put it into, what do you mean so, micro? How do you know it's micro-rich just because it's growing really well? So, so you're reading, you're reading the recipe where it says micro bridge yeah. soil to add in. Right. So that's what we're gonna do here. That's why okay. coming here to learn, we will. I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about today. No, no, easy, good question. Because this first one here called for micro bridge soil, kind of leaf mold on it, is maybe what it said. And then this one also calls for it. So I'll show you today just real quickly how to identify that and how to grab it because it's everywhere. It's it's. Um, and then our our last one that you guys have on there in terms of the sheets is this one where it says essentially free balanced minerals. And I included these three because these are the ultra low cost ways to get into this. And essentially for us, this is free because it's essentially free because it's right there behind us and it's blue and it's it's huge and taking a few buckets or even a 250 gallons from over there isn't going to ruin anyone's parade. In fact, you might help sea level rising. <laughs> Good idea. Redistribute. I'm there. Hey, aloha. This is Drake here, and uh, I want to thank you for checking in and tuning into this video. And uh, I just wanted to take a minute to ask you one small favor. So if this video has helped you in some way, made your life better, some way, uh, if you could help me out a little bit, um, asking for a little bit of donation. Uh, you'll notice in my YouTubes, I don't even have advertisements. Um, I'm completely community funded. Um, I love to, you know, I'd love to offer you a class or have an ebook in exchange. Or if you want to just take a moment and uh, make a financial contribution, that would go a long way for me. Uh, what I'll be doing with the money is to further my travels, further my research. Uh, be able to edit this content. Uh, if you notice this lens I'm filming on is a little bit scratched, I'd buy better equipment, make and produce better video. Um, and my mission is just to continue sharing the good news with you guys, keep PNF open source, and um, spread the love with everybody. So uh, thanks for watching. Um, the link's right here. And um, please uh, take, take a few minutes, make a contribution. You can do it through PayPal with your credit card, um, through just directly through my website making a monetary contribution but uh, also helps me because you know it takes time away from my farm you know when anytime I'm out here producing content um, you know I, I love I love doing both I love farming and I love taking care of you guys so if you can help me make that a little bit more sustainable uh, I really appreciate it and uh, thank you and I hope this video benefits you please like share you know or just you know do, do what you like but uh Love you guys. Okay. Aloha. But the key to it is diluting it. So every mineral flows off the land and goes into the ocean. 
every element is present in the ocean in some sort of um, molecule compound so there's gold in there but there's not just nuggets of gold it's bound with I don't, I don't forget exactly what it is but and even this one doesn't say but I have one in here that does say um, gold is bound with some sort of element there's even cesium and plutonium and uranium and all these things we might think like oh no those things are bad but they're all in our ocean but the key is they're balanced in our ocean and again all those elements we need again we need in living systems but they have to come in balance and that's the cool thing about the ocean is that it's all balanced gold is bound with chlorine two chlorines bound with gold and make a compound so gold chloride or whatever it is um, but i got a full list of all the elements of what's in there in this book um, so why not start with the easiest one which in my opinion is the balanced minerals is this one that we don't need to learn what leaf mold is the only thing we need to know is do we have seawater and going and grabbing going down here La Boyhood Point easy access to get down to the ocean um, you could go down White Peel and grab um, where you want to grab it from is probably not right next to the river because there's lots of fresh water going in so go to the far side of the beach where you can get a, a, away from the river but where the water is crashing on the rocks and it's getting foamy like that if you start to grab the very surface of the ocean you're going to gather a whole bunch of sea microorganisms too because basically in the top quarter inch half inch or so of the ocean is where majority of the microorganisms are living they're aerobic right in that top layer doing their thing and so if you grab the foamy water from the top that's where you're going to get a bunch of microbes if you want a bunch of minerals deeper in the ocean outside you're going to get really deep mineral water and those types of things both are good getting the sea microbes once you bring those on the land it's like bringing a bunch of foreigners in where kind of the land microbes kind of you know dated everybody already they're looking around like ah, i kind of seen that guy already seen them already you know i know their story whatever not so hot to just like jump in that pot right but bringing in the sea microbes to the land it's like bringing one infusion of, of foreigners into the land where you kind of look and they're a little exotic you're like oh i like that look i never seen that before i like that one and what happens is you're combining these exhausted soil microbes that couldn't do anything they never even like reproduce because they're like i know that one already yeah, yeah. you bring in these fresh ones they're like oh bro i like make you know i think that i want to try and you're going to reinvigorate them in this way that they're going to start reproducing and what you're going to create is this diversity you have a homogenous group for many years living together all going to kind of look the same they're going to have the same functions but you bring in these foreigners all of a sudden now they're going to have these different attributes like all of a sudden someone is cooking some spices you never smelled before and you're eating that and you're like oh this one is oh no like how, how you made that and now you're getting this information exchange these different microorganisms reinvigorating your land guys yeah can you use like uh, salt water or like a uh, You have to concentrate it even further probably to be a super effective weed killer. So even um, even more, I mean just just straight seawater would probably kill most things, but probably probably want to concentrate even more to use it as that. So by bringing sea microbes up you get the microbial diversity but the second part is this chemical reaction you're getting so that not only are you getting biology from your seawater you're also getting the chemical attributes of all these trace minerals trace I, I think nutrients is the right word I, I don't know if it's trace minerals is the right word trace minerals 
Oh, okay. Because I like being technical on that. And so you're getting trace minerals. And so the gold, the, the cesium, all those things that you may or may not need, you're getting them in one balanced way. So when you bring the seawater up, that helps to chemically flocculate your soil. Because what happens out here on Makua side, I'm in the deep soil just past, um, I, I live in Onomeo. And so I'm in like 20 feet, 30 feet of what is Mauna Kea ash. And so it, basically it is, if you start to take one shovel and you dig it in, the dirt is going to stick to that shovel and it's going to be so stuck and so it almost seems like clay. It's not clay, but it seems like it seems like you can make some bricks out of it and make some clay. If I heated that day, I'd have one haul it and then, you know, but what the seawater does is it comes into that thing that is just settled out particles and as the seawater penetrates down it's like your your soil right now is a bunch of plates stacked on top of each other nice dinner plates and so air and that kind of stuff has a hard time going through but imagine i took a golf ball and put it inside and i take a tennis ball and i put it inside now my stack of plates has spots where air can go inside maybe i could stick my hand through and so on the microscopic le level what you're doing is you're taking these things that your soil was all compacted was hard was stuck was sticking to the shovel was so like clay and you're chemically putting the diluted seawater which brings that because it's diluted it's just bringing a little bit it's not bringing too much salt to cause adverse effects for your your already your your plants it's diluted one to 30 and it's going down with the water and it's just depositing one of those elements through and it's not just coating it with salt you know it's not just like salt in your land you're getting just one particle being deposited and that acts as now chemically repelling as you get positive and negative charges it pushes that plate apart creates airspace and they call that function flocculation so you're chemically flocculating your land and your land just by putting some some diluted seawater you'll see it start to puff up where before it's like now oh, your top like little bit you can stick your finger inside whereas before you would have busted your finger trying to poke it in so in this aspect the chemical aspect of this you can just take sea salt and dilute this so this is um, sea salt. You don't want to use um, Martin salt because it has silica and that other stuff inside. Um, but sea salt, you, like you can use Himalayan salt, Alai salt, all, all those things. You know, even the Alai get the red minerals in it, it's even better. Um, but for me, I go with the cheapest sea salt I can get. Um, and mixing this into your water. So what I can do is I can reconstitute sea, sea water. And this is nice, like like I mentioned, uh, bringing the fresh seawater from the ocean, you get the extra biology, you get these things that the biology is not in here. So there's reason to go get fresh seawater. But fresh seawater is heavy. It's like this is, this right here is the equivalent of a five gallon bucket of the salt that was inside there. So think of how light this is I can fit how much five gallon buckets right in my pocket versus trying to put a five gallon bucket in my pocket and be like oh bro, I'll be up there in a minute hang on <laughs> versus like just walking up the hill so you gotta understand whether you want the biology or you just like this chemical aspect the chemical aspect has a lot of things and we can even kind of shortcut that and redo the bio biological part of it with a different recipe is it um, matter that that's mostly sodium versus a, like a lye or the pink Himalayan salt where you have more of a balance of multiple minerals involved? Um, I believe if you test this salt, because it's sea salt, you will chemically find it has all these elements present. So I don't know. I never did the chemistry on each salt, but I believe they're there. Um, some may be enriched, but salt is salt for the most part. Um, yeah, from from everything I know, you may know better than me. Um, so we need this, and we need one spoon. 
It's over here someplace. No. So, the reason I use a spoon is because I'm not very precise on the measurement of reconstituting it because our C, in fact, is not very constant in terms of its salinity. So I don't have to hit this right on the head, but I want to be within a tolerance. And so, it's super easy to reconstitute sea salt into water to dilute 1 to 30, which is what the same salinity as my blood. One to thirty. So this stuff, you could, you know, you, that's why you get saline um, IVs instead of just straight water. It's um, it's also the same salinity. Yeah, I guess there's the blood. So what it is is basically one spoonful per gallon. Taste, tablespoon, teaspoon, no matter, because, like I said, the salinity of the sea varies anywhere from like 3% to like 7%, somewhere in there. So, right here, I'm adding in one spoonful, and I got approximately four gallons in this, in this bucket, so how many spoons should I add? <laughs> you guys are already pros on this recipe. So, so if you're using salt water, how would you measure what to what? So if I was using seawater, I, I would I would go and measure, so this, this is four gallons, so I would say, okay, well, it's a lot easier for me to convert this into liters, so I would multiply that by four and say I got 16. And then from that, I need a 1 to 30 dilution. And so I would say I need a half liter, approximately, to go into that. But, however, if you are lazy like me, and you don't like make those calculations, I have an app. It's $3.99 or something. It's for Apple and Android. And it is called Banff Solutions. It's on the Play Store as well as the iPhone Store. And you can hit this app and you can say to it, okay, we want to make four gallons, right? No. No. So I put in four gallons, I hit calculate, and now it tells me I should add 757 milliliters of seawater. So, if you want to go easy on it, yeah, I built that's... this thing. Yeah. Drake, if for example you're going to do a large acreage area and you want to knock a solution, do you be more wise or as equally wise to use the seawater because you're doing a larger volume area rather than have to mix with sea salt and make your own solution? It, it all depends. If you, so if you're able to get a tote and bring it up from the ocean and then have your tote stored, and if you're going to store seawater, try to store it out of direct sunlight. Start it under the ground if you can, um, in, a, in one thing where the temperature not going to fluctuate too much. It actually gets sweeter and better the longer you store it, as long as it's not... If you ever open it and it smells pilau, then don't use it because it, it went sour, but you can get contamination or whatever inside if you're not careful. But usually it smells just like the ocean, like you went tide pools and you're smelling the beach smell, like, the, you know, it, then that's good. But for me, just getting sea salt is pretty cheap. You can even buy a thing called C90. It's an agricultural product. And they take the salt out of that, which, I don't know, the sodium and the chloride is important, but you're mostly going after these trace minerals. So you can buy C90. It's an ag product that they sell. You can get that in bulk. Same, but same dilution, 1 to 30. Once you get it, it reconstitute it. But this here, pretty simple. The only thing left to do is just to mix this in. And now this is going to not only flocculate my trees and make the land start to come nice, it's, um, it's also essential for microbes. When you're watering, like if I just drink water all day and say I'm running a race and I'm just drinking water, I'm going to get mean cramps, right? I need to drink something like Gatorade with electrolytes in it. So I made the electrolytes joke earlier, it's kind of, there's one truth to it. We do want to put some Gatorade or Ina Aid out on our land. And just by mixing this little bit of salt in, I'm now giving the microbes not only water, but electrolytes. 
So if they was doing some power lifting that day, they're not gonna catch cramps and they're gonna be able to do more power lifting tomorrow for me. And I like make it as easy for the microbes in the soil to do power lifting as I can. Because if they do it, then I don't gotta, right? It's my team. So stirring this in, making it dissolve really well if you're using this. Um, and then there's a reason also, I don't know if anyone's like biodynamic studies that, but there's a whole reason for structuring water, giving it um, just its holding capacity. A little bit of this salt is going to change this from being hydronium and hydroxide spinning on each other to actually a liquid crystal matrix. And the molecules are all going to align and the electricity is going to flow so much better through salt water than regular water. So my electra, or electric conductivity in my soil is changing. Right? Now the electricity can flow better and the whole thing is a charge field potential yeah, between that land and the sky and then that's how plants and everything grows. So this, putting this into the soil is going to help that conduit happen. So the energy my tree is bringing in, everything's going to distribute better. The microbes are going to be able to send electronic signals from here to there. All of a sudden it's like, oh, the radio works. Oh yeah, the radio works. Shoots, okay, we'll bring that. Yeah, I'll bring that. Shoots. So just one simple, easy, everybody can do this. Yeah? Salt is cheap. The ocean is free. All depends on your truck and your tank and how you like, you know, make this work for you. But, man, you taste it. It tastes just like, not, not even that salty. So it's always when, um, although with rat lung and stuff, I don't advocate tasting this kind of stuff. Okay. You know, be careful. <laughs> um, so that's recipe number one, the one on the back. Any questions on that? Who can afford that one? Yeah, everybody. Yay. <laughs> So this is really good to add to things that are fruiting. When you add this when they're fruiting, the things get sweeter. You can even foliarly spray this right before your plant is fruiting and you will notice, oh wow, it's sweeter this year. The sweetness has come from all these trace nutrients, these trace minerals that are in sea salt. So this is really good as a foliar that time or a soil drench for those reasons I outlined before. What if you were prepping a field for the intention to have orchards and you know, growing crops later on, right? And currently it's guinea grass or other than just sort of a pasture grass. Uh, you mentioned about the fruit coming sweeter. Is there an equal benefit to inoculating that soil in advance of anticipating orchards growing there eventually? Yes, to a degree. Your guinea grass is also going to get sweeter and then you can graze it down and you could finish cattle on that. So if you look on this island where the pastures are that they're finishing cattle, grass finished, which has got to be your best pasture. You cannot just grass finish on any pasture. You got to do it at these good ones. These pastures are right around the ocean. All the pastures they use for grass finish near the ocean. So that sea spray is constantly blowing out the grass is just naturally richer there are more minerals inside so if you're way malka and the sea spray is not coming up to you say the blessings because all your stuff ain't rusting in your house like you're living right next to the sea <laughs> but bring this stuff up and bring it to your land because that's where you need it because the higher up is the less all the minerals is flowing from top to down so you need to bring these minerals back up malka back up to your place and if you start using this and you got guinea grass already your guinea grass you know it, it's actually one pretty good grass what it's doing for the land and how and this is a great cattle feed so you kind of want to convert it either either you're gonna mow it and then mulch with it or you want to graze it down and use it some way that way um, but just putting this stuff thinking the guinea grass is gonna go away no the guinea grass just gonna get more strong but that's not a bad thing. You, you thinking of it as a resource. So, so moving on to the next one of how can we make the guinea grass more of a res resource to us? We're just gonna go backwards to the book. This next one is talking about essentially free balanced nutrients. And 
for me, what happens in my farming practice is that compost and that kind of stuff is great, but it's heavy. For me, lifting compost, shoveling this, making sure the pile is turned, unless I figure out how to automate it and lift it with a tractor and do some diesel work, I'm gonna be there all day busting my back turning compost piles. Which for certain cases, awesome. You want it, right? But for me, what I found is, Brad, I'd rather go liquid. If I can take that same compost, put it in one barrel in one central place, run it through a small pump like this and bring that nutrient from here down to those fields. Like, I don't want to carry all that compost down to that, those, that orchard down below. Even though I could use it and it would hugely benefit from it. But I'm like, ah, oh, bro, I got to cut all this, turn it with one tractor. We even get one tractor. Now we got to get one barn. Now we got to get the rust off the tractor. Now we got to make sure the thing, oil is changed. The hydraulic is all good. Bro, that's how much jobs I did for just, I wanted to go put make those trees go good I mean that's plenty overhead for all that so I try in my practice I try to teach people how can you make it as easy as possible because if it's not easy you're not gonna do them you can try it the first time because you're super excited you're like oh, I'm gonna try this but then the second time you're like ah no it's kind of raining I don't think today is the day <laughs> oh yeah I get doctor's appointment on oh, no the can yep mm-hmm and pretty soon six weeks go by your things all bust it's all dying and you never did it, it wasn't because of all that mistakes it wasn't because you was too busy it's because you never had one system or that is efficient that's easy that makes you where you just out there and you're like oh, i love doing my trees look how good they're growing this is so simple this is the way and so what i do is i go in liquid way so instead of turning big compost i make liquid plant fertilizer which is the food for this so this first one the minerals also liquid I can still run this through my same pump this thing right here I can set I got a 200 foot extension cord I could go soak the guys on the far side of the market right now from this this pump running right here off one tank I could just walk over there and the only thing I'm carrying is the end of my hose which kind of when that long of a hose you got to have some skills to like not get it tangled and stuff but I can get over there and I never had to carry all this I wouldn't even sweat versus try to imagine me carrying one 30 gallon trash can over there bro the time I got over there I'd be like oh okay I powered it so this is the way I try to go liquid that's why this next one is liquid if you can figure out how to cut this stuff easy put it in one liquid barrel and you fill that thing up with plant material. This thing will then go through some of the nastiest smelling fermentation process that is so incredibly gross. But that thing is chock full of the best micro or of the best nutrients. The microbes is not that good. That's why it smells. But the nutrients are in there. And it went through a process called putrefaction. And so you can think of that as like zombies killing each other and like the days of the dead is what's happening and just like the most brutal death stuff is happening in that barrel. And that's why the microbes you smell is smelly. Imagine one zombie with flesh dripping off. You're probably not gonna smell like clean. You're gonna be like, oh, bro, I smell you. That's how you know zombies is coming, smell them. <laughs> but you can have that inside. But what you can do is you can throw one simple aerator into your tank. So even though I got this nasty, super nasty concentrate, I just take enough, which on there it says dilute one to 10, right? Something like that, what does it say, one to 20? One to 100. One to 100 even. So it all depends. You're gonna be somewhere between one to 10 and one to 100. I wrote one to 100 on there to be safe. For us out here where we get way more rain than most people, you can go stronger. Yeah. All depends about the excess moisture around you. 1 to 100 is safe anywhere. 1 to 10, 1 to 25 out here for us is, is good. If you're going more than that, you're going to be spraying it. It's still going to smell. Flies can come and it's going to be kind of gross too. But you put this concentrated leaf, gross grass, whatever you threw inside this barrel, you put it, dilute it 1 to 25 into your, your barrel that you're going to spray from. It's diluted 1 to 25 and you bubble that for 24 hours and then the thing doesn't smell bad 
you've essentially taken these anaerobic pathogen microorganisms that were with these nutrients and by adding oxygen you've killed off those anaerobes and you're smelling the anaerobes so all the zombies died but they left all the resources around all the food that they were eating so by aerating kill out the zombies Did a bio digester enhance this concept? Same in your bio digester, you're gonna have they smell, right? It stinks. You're not going around your bio digester like, oh, it smells good yeah. today. It's like, oh, bro, you know, you got. Yeah. So the bio digester, same thing. You can take some of that concentrate, dilute it this way, bubble it, and you will get that aerobes to come in, and then it becomes a really good plant fertilizer. So. Method for this is to go and take up, it says on there, take up the barrel, right? The picture, pack it full of grass. Then you add some rich soil, I think it says. So we'll, we'll, go over, we'll go over what that part is and then we fill it with water. And so what you add to this, what type of grass you add, if you're throwing food scraps, if you're throwing all kinds of things, you're gonna change the nutritional requirements of it. So if I want if I want something for early growth, I want a high nitrogen, balanced, cheap, ultra low cost food. Throw in my food scraps. Throw in my meats. Throw in you know I don't know if you're eating meats, but I do. Throw throw that stuff inside. Throw in um, you know dead mongoose. You find them on the road. Find a dead pig. Throw that thing inside. Same water, same food stuff. As this thing is breaking down, that is now one highly nitrogen rich. And I cannot legally say this in Hawaii, but you make the kind inside, and now you're going super nitrogen rich, yeah? Because this, the stuff that comes out this side is plenty of nitrogen, the stuff that comes out this side is plenty of nitrogen. And now you got one thing like that, and as long as you're aerating it and low things, but I can tell you that's, you know, you just can imagine what my decline meant and my hand signals and those things. But it's not legal for me to say any of that. But you are one fertilizer machine. Pooping in the right place makes all the difference, and your plants going to just thrive from that. So you, if you think, oh, I don't have enough nitrogen, you know what to do, right? Mm -hmm. However, if you want um, chlorophyll and those types of things, grasses like this are, are awesome. If you have a whole bunch of extra fruits, rotting fruits, rotting guavas on the ground, all that kind of stuff, scoop them up, put it in this barrel, and you will now get the, the phosphorus, the potassium, um, the, the huge NPK elements we need that are already assembled in this fruit. And they're coming out and now into the water. Once they're in, it takes about two weeks for them to get nice in the water, but the longer I leave it, the zombies keep going, bro. It's the zombie apocalypse. They keep breaking it down and it gets nastier and nastier. Actually, it kind of smells better after they get to a certain level of zombiness, but... Um, but they, they keep breaking it down and then you, you can then get those nutrients. So if you said you can use fruits, does that include using a high concentration of citrus? Because we have a lot of citrus, so can we use that or does that, that be too much? Uh, I, would, I would watch out. If you're diluting 1 to 100 with your citrus, you should be okay. Oh, okay. But if you're diluting stronger with the citrus, the citrus has, um, has other compounds in there that can sometimes burn things. Okay. So you... Add the uh, aeration from the beginning, or is it after the two weeks? So I have I have one tank that's my concentrated, distinct thing that I'm constantly putting more. Anytime I weed, I put all my weeds, and I have that tank with the water. Then I have one separate barrel that I'm gonna spray out. And this separate barrel, if it's one to twenty-five, I usually work in with a twenty-five gallon trash can, uh -huh. and I just take one one gallon and dump it inside. And now I got that diluted 1 to 25. And this tank right here that I diluted 1 to 25 into, not aerating this tank. Oh, okay. So it's not the... It's no, because... No, 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 no. Because I... Yeah, like, I don't even want to put my air stone in that thing. It's so gross. Don't even put your hand in it. Trust me. You're, all your friends will know, oh, you did that. Smell <laughs> for a week. <laughs> yeah. I use one cup with one handle so I get it not get it on me and sometimes it spills oh be careful. 
I have higher value recipes elsewhere, but I just, this is the ultra low cost. It's, you know, cheap is cheap, right? But, so putting that in, but once you aerated it in this tank, now this, this one to 25 dilution, one, you know, one to 10, some, some dilution around that bubbling. Now, after 24 hours, this should be pretty safe. This thing should actually have a decent smell. If I put my hand in there and smell it, it's like, like my friend's not gonna know like an hour afterwards. They're gonna be like, oh, you know, if I walk right up to them, they're like, oh, is he doing that? And then, but an hour later, they're gonna be like, oh yeah, you cool. Come, come hang out. Does it matter if you use green waste or that's green and fresh or like dry grass clippings or other plants that's already dried up and brown? Uh, green, green and fresh is going to have even more of um, the things you're looking for in it, but um, but you can use anything, and and that's what I'm saying is, as you start to use different things, you will change the nutritional profile of your solution. So usually, what people do is they have one that is like uh, like a high nitrogen one. They're going to put like those types of products in. Usually, they'll have one that's just like a grass one. Um, yeah, and then you can make one from bones and eggshells to have more like calcium type stuff going on. So you can think, you know, you can go look up what, like, you know, I, I guarantee there is actually a nutritional analysis for this guinea grass. And you can see what's in there. And it's not to say 100% is going to be in your liquid, but you could even do nutritional analysis on that liquid if you really wanted to know. Um, for me, I try to balance it where it's like, okay, I got a high nitrogen one and use that early and then I use the grass one when things are growing already. Um, and then I'll use a fruit one when things are starting to fruit. So that's, that's um, one way to go through and to have a few different of these tanks based on, especially if you're doing an orchard where everything's coming at the same time. In my case, spring around my house, I got diverse polyculture, all kinds of stuff. So I kind of blend them. So would you do one with like fish remains, like a separate barrel? Yeah. If, if you want to discriminate between like higher nitrogen versus more just like grassy, just like, you know, that kind of food. Yeah. And if you don't, put mix them all the same. Oh, no, on the grass works. Oh, the is excellent. Yeah. Got yeah, lots of that. Yeah. <laughs> And if you guys aren't growing comfrey, I recommend you plant comfrey because that is one plant that you can cut and throw into this thing and oh, it, it's, it's really good. Nice. Grows great around here. <coughs> so, so we're going to have a little bit of uh, finding these microbes. What is good microbial rich soil? So right here, before we go do it, I have two choices. One is I have this grassland right here. Well, actually, I got more than two choices. Don't let me put you in a dialectic. Um, got the grass here. I got this land right under me. And I'll suck on, I got that mango tree behind me. So I can pick those as the three just within our 20 foot radius here of what we got. And the ground under me right here is probably not the best choice because this thing has been mowed and there's looks like they dropped gravel in here and there's not that much stuff happening in terms of organic matter cycling around and those types of things but if I look at this guinea grass right here I can see they've been mowing they've actually been throwing the thing the guinea grass itself is just kind of self composting underneath and the guinea grass is that tall so when I'm looking at it, I know the roots are going down that tall. And if I go over to that guinea grass, I'm going to start to find mycelial strands if I start digging right around the root zone. When I, but right here, I don't see any mycelial strands, right? Like if, even if I dig into here, it's like, oh no, it's not there. So that type of choice right there where you're seeing mycelium, where you're seeing matter being decomposed, you know that's the microbes recycling it. You know something is digesting it to make the grass grow that tall. Because try to look at the trees. The tree's not even that tall and been growing there. You know, I mean the grass grows faster, but something different is happening right here with the grass and all this system versus trying to grow the trees in this mowed lawn. 
right? There's probably more mycelial th there than there is out here. And if you look at that mango tree, one different function is happening, right? Under the mango tree. Fruit decomposing. Fruit is decomposing, but also try look, there's no grass under the mango tree, huh? Or maybe there is. But you would notice if you had that mango tree out in out in your forest, you go under the mango tree and usually no more grass under the mango tree. Right? The leaf litter is up, you know, it's like five inches tall. And you go dig in that and you can find branches and those branches are gonna be coated white with mycelia on it. And you can find you can dig into the ground, it's gonna be all moist. It's not all dry. The moisture there harboring the mycelium. That is even one better choice because if I go get this from the grassland, I'm gonna get microbes that are gonna go grass. But what I wanna do is spray it on these trees over here. And do I want the trees to turn back to the grassland? Or do I want them to turn to this fertile mango tree? So if I get the leaders, the people that are colonizing, that are making that mango good, I multiply them up to large populations and then I put them back out into where my my um, my orchard wants to be. Now I'm taking those workers that are already, they're, they're like, oh yeah, I know how to build trees. Yeah, just give me a call. Versus these guys, you ask them to build trees, they're like, uh, we grow big ass grass. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> so you can go gather the guys from right under that and they're already, that's their job. That's what they do. They grow trees. They, that's, you know, that's their day. So if I want to grow trees, I grab from there. If I want to grow better guinea grass, I go grab from over here. But you can even grab some from here, some from there and blend and get one diversity. And it's all about diversity. But you also want the good guys. You know? So grabbing from the tree, that's where we'll do it today. But essentially what we're looking for is we can go over there and I can pull up some dirt. So you guys all ready for a small mini field trip? Yeah, let's do it. generator So what I'm looking for on this side, and so I looked, I looked under the tree and all that side kind of getting more mowed and stuff, but I found it right here when I was looking and then you see kind of leaf decaying, you know, mycelia right there eating the thing, you know. And so the thicker this was, the better it is. The, but you notice the grass is growing less under here. It has to do with the shade, but it also has to do with this is a more fungal oriented system. And so what I'm trying to do is, if I look right here, you see this dirt right here? Without me disturbing it right here, you see how this stuff is balled up? Yeah. Versus you go look outside in the grass out there and you're not gonna find the soil in the same like kind of balls. And what I'm trying to do is gather this very top stuff right here that this dirt, actually if you look at this one, it's like a rock I think, but actually has like mycelia growing between this dirt and this rock right here. And so these are the microbes that I'm looking for because these guys are indigenous to this soil. They're right here living in this soil and they're breaking down rock, turning rock into nutrients. They're using sugar from the tree to, to break down this rock. So these are the guys I'm looking for. When it says leaf mold, I'm not talking about this leaf that's right on top. I'm talking about the actual guys that are in this soil that are making these balls happen. Because when I bust these balls open, I like using that term, they are all nice and and this is chock full of microorganisms. If I go put this under a slide and go, I'm gonna find beneficial fungus right here. And if this leaf litter was even bigger, it'd be even better. So you try to look for an area right in your area that's a little bit 
same altitude or a little bit higher where you can find a mango tree or something where you're seeing the soil naturally forming these balls. Um, yeah, it would be good. I'd also grab from, because uh, eucalyptus has some pretty uh, selective oils in it. I would also gather from another spot, but I, but I would use that as well. Yeah, I mean, eucalyptus is great out here. Um, so as you're looking under, you're trying to find, which, which this area over here is mowed, so I, I didn't realize it's as mowed as it is, but trying to find an area where basically you're just scraping this top area and I'm not trying to grab the stones I'm trying to grab this bald soil up and this stuff is what you're going to add to that bucket of water and your plant material and these guys know how to go and break it down is that the, bucket? the first one or the one that's being aerated is this is the first one this is the, the, the concentrated yeah. zombie bucket we'll call it for today but these guys go inside, they start to break that thing down, and these are our good indigenous, very strong, fungally oriented uh, microorganisms. So for us, if we can all gather from wherever you think, and I'm, I'm, I came to this site because I think probably right here as I get more into this guinea grass, and I have this exchange happening. Okay, look at the microbes that are coming right here, you know, like on this stick, like I said, you see all the, all of my cilia, but you also see this dirt glob to this stick. And the, it's, what's happening is the bacteria kind of glob the stuff up and make glomulin, but then the fungus roll them into these balls. And that's why this ball is actually formed. It's actually because the fungus is actually shaping this. So when I gather this dirt that's right here, this I know, is already going to have plenty of fungus on it. It's, it's talking to this carbon source and, and it's, I can see the visual mycelia here, but this dirt is what I want. This, this balled up stuff. And right here, so right here on the edge of this, you see how all the dirt is really nice and all that falls? Where, where right there was a little bit more disturbed and more ran over, but it didn't run over right here. You see how it's like all this soil on the top of these nice balls. You see them? This is the stuff I want to gather, this very top thing, because all these, these aren't stones, these are actually globs of dirt, and the fungus and the mice, microbes are making that happen. So, if we can all gather some, because we need about, we need about that much like, to, to do this next thing that we're going to do. So, um, so if you guys want to go and see and find and just make this observation and see and grab some and... Well, if we all brought that much, we'll have oh, way much, but that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Exactly. So in, in that book, she has this thing where she takes her seeds and she puts them in her mouth and she's tuning it into her DNA. And, but her DNA, but also her microbiome. And then the plants that she grows with it, ha they, they're tuned into what her frequency and her signature is. And then when the plants grow, they're able to deliver customized medicine and nutrition for her. So in a certain sense, where I had you guys all participate in this, I also got a copy of all your microbiome and your DNA through that on this dirt. So not only are we grabbing the soil microbiome, we're also getting a kind of part of our human microbiome, and I'll shake my beard in there too. <laughs> so now there's plenty, right? But you're basically off-gassing a microbial cloud everywhere you go, no matter what you do. And what you can do is you can change your microbial makeup on yourself and your human cells are these big things that for every like one human cell, there's like a hundred microorganism cells. And so that's why when you look at me, even though my microbes outnumber my human cells about 10 to 1 to 100 to 1, somewhere in there, I look human. You look at me, you're like, oh, this guy's a human, right? It's only because they're so big. You cannot see what I really am, which is a collection of microorganisms. But what's cool about knowing that is knowing that basically my human cells are my hardware. So like my computer, the physical parts of my computer. That's what my human cells are. But if I just had the physical computer, I can then run different operating system on it a different program like I can pull up Windows and I can then run Microsoft Word on it and write a document and then use the internet and all these things that just the, all the different computers if you don't have the program you cannot do that right I mean you, you could but you got to learn how to really use the thing you know so what these are what we just gathered is the operating system it's the software we're gonna run that on this different hardware, but we're gonna upgrade the software. And that's what this, these mycelia and these things are enabling us to do, is to take the software, and get it to go power itself up and then reinstall it back into our, our computer, which is like our LAN. So imagine you could get, all of a sudden you're using Windows 3.1 from 1985 or 90, 93 I think it was. And now all of a sudden you're put, able to put Windows 10 on it and now you're like, oh, it's kind of confusing, but it looks shinier. <laughs> I don't know which one is better. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> but that's the idea. We can do upgrades. So this is the power of the microorganisms. Not only in you, you put some of your microbe, your software in this, but you can upgrade it and then apply it. And then hopefully your plant's going to respond to you better on hardware, software, kind of abstract idea, yeah? So, the, the one where we do the grass and the, or the meat scraps or these, either these items into the bucket with the water with these guys, are there any questions? Come on, water. So, water is a great question, and are you guys, like, out here, the, the best water we can use is rain water. If you are using county water or, um, or well water, you, um, you want to check the hardness of it. And um, the harder your water is, the more microbes you're going to need. But rainwater is usually, it's, it's soft. It's like, that's kind of the definition of it because it doesn't have those calciums and those things in it. Um, so if you have harder water, add more microbes. Is there an issue also with county water, how they treat it in certain areas? And could that be a detriment to what you're trying to do in stimulating microbes? Like they put chlorine in it, for example? Yes. Do you want to let it lay fallow for 24 hours and then use it for system? So I'm going to use this in the French sense of the word, that the chemicals they put in are retardants. So if you drink in a whole lot of that, you might think of the American version of what that means, but 
in the French version, when I was in France, I was looking at the, the train and it said, the train is retard. And I was like, oh, that's, that's kind of funny. I didn't, you know, because my American way of thinking what that means in my head, I was like, oh, but it just meant the train was late, right? So when I use the word retarded, I just mean that it's a little late. So if I have chlorinated water, it's retarded water, it's gonna make my things go a little slower. Oh. So, I'm sorry, so the question is, would it benefit you if you had to use county water to let it sit, dissipate for a while before you use it in this application? You could. Yep, you could if you want, or you could just go straight with it and just realize it's gonna be a little slower. Well, most chlorine off gas is really fast, but now they put chloramine in our water and that stuff is uh, there. So you could run reverse osmosis water, you could do a bunch of stuff, but it's best just to set out a thing and catch rainwater if you can. Oh. Or ditch water I think is fine here too. You guys got access to the ditch. I don't know what the uh, food safety regulations are, but um, ditch water would work just fine. So do you cover these containers, your big gallon, whatever, your big buckets, do you cover them and let this microbes eat the thing or do you leave them uncovered? It's a great question. Covered or uncovered for this barrel, you are all going to choose to cover it. Why? Because if you leave it uncovered, my mosquitoes love breeding in this. They will nail you. Plus, this is going to stink like the zombie apocalypse. So don't do this right next to your house. Do this one out where it's like, okay. But however, I had an idea that we've been brewing, which is basically if I got a whole bunch of these buckets and I pack them with these these weeds and then I put them under my fruit trees and I put a screen over the top, every time it rains, the thing's gonna overflow and then it's gonna be one auto fertilizer for me. So I was thinking, oh, how can I make this easier and more lazy? Like, that's an easy, more lazy idea. Except for then I got to hustle and earn the, enough money to have that much rubbish cans. Yeah. And the screen, and then it pays going to come knock them over. You know, each has its cost benefit. But why not put them out there and have them overflow? <laughs> Five gallon bucket works just fine for each one. In my case, when I'm making this, I'm making it in the 32 gallon brute, or 30, I think it's 32 gallon brute containers, the heavy duty trash cans. And I just have them right around the house that we make it. I also have a bunch of five gallon buckets that I did for my food scrap. So I throw my food scraps inside. And then you'll get all black soldier flies and all kinds of stuff getting in there. Um, it's, it's gross, but it's pure nutrients. Is it better to put it in the shade? Does it make a huge difference? In terms of your plastic lasting longer, the shade would be better. Um, Is there any benefit to allowing soldier flies to lay eggs in? So soldier flies are going to go in there and breed and they're going to steal your nutrients and they're going to turn them into larvae and then they're going to climb out and your nutrients are going to fly away. However, if you get a whole bunch of soldier fly inside and you kill them in the water, now you got now you got nutrients in your water. So something something like a pig, which takes a long time to break down. If I just take that pig and put it put in a bucket of water, it's gonna take forever. However, you go look at a pig that dies in a pasture and the thing is gone in four days. Gone, just one oil spot where it was, right? And maybe the jaw is left and a few bones. If the other pigs never hit it yet. So what's happening, you look at that pig after day two, well, day one, it's all bloated. Day two, you come out maggots just all over the thing. And then day three, it's like when heat, when water flow and fountain of maggots and day four, you come out, it's gone already. It's like they ate that entire pig that fast. So what you can do is you put the pig in the bucket, all those maggots come, once all the maggots are there, then you drown them. Now they've broken down your entire pig into those maggots and then you drown them before they stole your nutrients and flew away. So that's one like hack to break down animal waste real fast. Use the insects and then drown the insects. So you can punch a hole in your screen with the flies can get in. But they can't because it's just such a large area that they can't find their way out. 
And you get even more nutrients that way. Or even, you know, put that thing near your chicken pen and it'll attract flies and your chickens will not hit them, so. Um, but just, you know, word of warning, you know, no, it's stinky, it's kind of gross, but this is the cheapest, easiest way to do it. And the reason I, I like to talk about this kind of stuff is because there's so much land out here that could benefit from this. And if you're thinking of a solution that costs like, you know, dollars a gallon or whatever you're gonna be like oh bro, i can't even afford that land but this thing this recipe so far you know just cost me a little bit of time to find these guys the buckets that i had and then the labor to cut the weeds and put them inside and then my spring right which all those costs i had to do anyway so um so i, I put a lid on it i put a trap a solid lid on top it doesn't matter it gets gross once in a while come out with a stick not a stick you care about and push it and just have the thing rotate because the weeds will start growing on the top and then you rotate them sink them to the bottom and the thing keeps rotating continue to refill it um and the first time you do it it takes two weeks but after that two weeks you're good to go you can continually draw liquid off and this is one way to bioremediate like this whole land out here you can put it in and start spraying it and now you're putting the food out But you should cover it with a solid color for two weeks before you put the mesh on. Uh, either, either way, like, like, are you, what, how are you thinking of using it? Like, are you yeah, gonna? I was gonna put it under a fruit tree. Oh, um, you no, no, just put the put the mesh right away. Mesh right away. Yeah. Right at the beginning. Yeah. Because it's you know it's not gonna rain that hard that fast. I mean, it, unless we have Hurricane Lane coming, then you know, be real careful. <laughs> It's gonna fill up three, four times already in that, like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but this is the food component. So any any last questions? Food component is that is that clear? We're gonna put this stuff. We're gonna put enough of this. So so for me, when I'm doing a 30 gallon trash can, all this material we gathered here, I put in about four times this amount into a 30 gallon trash can. This amount here is what I would put into this five gallon bucket. And when I put it in, I kind of push it up a little bit so it gets all muddy. You know, I break up those balls and get them to go into the thing. Where do you get this bag? This bag I got from a marijuana grow store. They use it to make bubble hash. And this is great because it's 220 microns. And it's and it's super hardcore. I used to buy a paint strainer bag from Ace, and then the thing just rips after four or five times. This thing I've had for years. Where do you get it again? Uh, my friend got it on a Wahoo, but you can go to Amazon and look up bubble hash bags, and they sell these things. Yeah, I don't know what bubble hash is, but anyway. <laughs> Must be good stuff. <laughs> um, so, so now we covered minerals. We now covered the the food. The last bit to cover is these microbes themselves. And I talked about the microbes being these zombie guys. Those are not the guys we're looking for in this next recipe, which is your first recipe on your on your book there. It's the one I call Ina A. We are not looking for the zombies because we don't want to go out to our land with our trees and spray the zombies out there because they're going to come to our tree and be like, they're in. I, don't, I was trying to think of something for brains. <laughs> Walnuts. I don't, I don't know what's mango a brain. Yeah, they're going to be like, oh, mango. And you don't want to put those guys out there. You don't want to put zombies out there. These guys in this state right here are not zombies. These guys were fully functioning. They had one whole colony. They had one super system until we picked them up and totally put them in this bag. And now they're like, what is going on? <laughs> but they were functioning. What we want to do is we want to go gather the functioning system. And then we want to provide it two things. Three, well, three things. Water, because life needs water. Electrolytes, because these guys are going to be doing some power lifting. We don't want them to get cramps. 
And a third thing, what do you need before you go on a big run? Fuel. Carbs. We're on a carbo load, right? We want to make sure we get readily, carbs are readily available energy. So we want to have those three things for these guys. Water, electrolytes, and carbs. So in this bucket already, I already got my electrolytes, right? I already made this as one different solution. This one I could use straight. But I can also now put these microbes in there into this water and they got the perfect balance of electrolytes. The only thing I need left to put into this is the carbs, right? I want these guys to grow. So that's why we brought some potato. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So basically, what we need is about two potatoes for this size, and it's it's all you know like a lot of these recipes. I'm I'm just getting you close, shotgunning, getting you close to it. But um, so if you're gonna scale this up, um, it's not one direct scale because you for every four gallons you're not gonna add two potatoes. You would you would have way you're you'd have way too many potatoes. But for this small size I gotta use two and then it scales up. Really what you're looking for is right now I, I mixed all the salt in there thoroughly so it's dissolved. What I'm looking for now is to take the potato and to take my clean water and I'm just grinding this up in here and what I'm trying to that's a cooked potato already cooked. cooked yeah 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 cooked okay. cooked hot potato. Okay like you're gonna eat it. Yeah, forget like you're gonna eat it. But what I'm looking to do is I'm looking to get this whole water full of starch. And if I look at it right now with just one potato inside, you see it's still kind of liquidy, watery. It's still like, bruh, if you gave this soup to me, I'd be like, okay, mostly water soup, okay? I can go with that. But you like get one full meal, yeah? We want these micros to be super powered up. So we're gonna have the second potato. So when they taste this thing, they're like, oh yeah, I taste the potato now. Your water soup tastes like potato. <laughs> and once I got this second potato in there, you can see it's a little bit more, um, you know, cloudy. And that's essentially what I'm trying to do is just get it cloudy enough because, you know, I don't have to grind up all this little stuff at the bottom. If you can, throw it in a blender first, make it just, you know, but, but essentially, you're just trying to get this nice starchy water where it looks like, you know, not just water soup, but potato soup. You can use sweet potato, you can use ulu, you can use kalo, you can use cassava, you can use, I don't know. Rice wash? Rice wash, even. Uh, but the cheaper your source of this, the better cheap. Potatoes are really cheap. And the other thing about the potato is the way the carbohydrates are, they're really simple. And so as a carbohydrate source, the simpler it is, that means the faster my life can grow. So that's why I use potato. But this guy here, like that. And then the last little bit to this is now to put our life in there, right? So we got electrolytes, we got starch source, we got water. Now we're going to add our little life. So the same life that I added that I would add to my grass food is the same life that I want to grow here. And so just taking this stuff and again, kind of um, busting them up a little bit. And I did it in this order so you guys could see the water change. You can see the salt fully dissolved and then you guys can see now I'm turning it all muddy, the water. No shame, you got a little leaf matter in there, Drake, or grass clippings by accident. Yeah, no worries, because what, what I'm going to do is, before I use this, is, yeah, like, and the grass clippings full of microbes, all kinds of good stuff. Before I use this, I'm going to pour it back through this filter bag before it goes into my tank. And I, everything I filter before I throw it through my machine. But this now, this mix is set to now be incubated. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take these soil microbes that I found, I'm putting them into this aquatic environment. So it's way different from them. They're like, oh bruh, I lived in the soil and I had a little bit of water. What the heck is this water environment? And I'm going to go through, but in the water is the quickest breeding ground. In the soil, they have a hard time. Like they're like, 
oh yeah, I kind of like you, but you're way over there versus the water. They're like, oh, I like you, bro. I'll be right there. Shoots. They just swim right over and boom. It's like, oh. So they start making love in this water solution really fast. But they're going to go through a generation about every half hour. So for them, they're going through about 20 years in an hour or 40 years in an hour. You know, they're going through these generations really fast. What's going to happen is the population is going to go like this, take off, and at a certain point, they're going to reach a saturation where they, they've eaten all the food and all the oxygen and everything, and then they're going to crash down the backside. And so the soil microbes are going to take off like this and then crash. And what I want to do is I want to in, intercept that curve of them growing right here before they take that turn and they crash. Once they take that turn and they crash, I'll still have microbes in there, but I'll have zombie guys. On the way up right now, it's these soil guys that are just made, they're like, oh, this aquatic environment, I'm not totally used to this, but it's okay, I'm gonna survive right now. And they're just gonna start breeding with all this, these electrolytes and carbohydrates. But at a certain point, they're gonna, they're gonna run out of that, and the guys that are zombies are gonna take over and they're gonna crash. How do you detect by looking at it when you're at that right point to get it? One of the easiest ways is your nose knows best. And when I smell it and I got the good soil guys, they smell sweet. When I got the zombies, they smell like zombies. Oh, well, that's too late. So there's another visual sign though. And what's going to happen to this right now, I can skim kind of some of that grass off the top. But you notice right now there's no bubbles eventually here in the next couple hours or so small bubbles are going to start rising up and the bubbles are going to form rings because what's happening is these microbes as they're reproducing they're actually swimming around and they're creating convection inside of this tank so they're actually bringing oxygen up to the top the oxygen the gas exchange is sinking and they're actually creating convection and they're actually keeping this even though it's I didn't bubble it, it's still aerobic because they're making that convection happen and there's still oxygen in our water and they're, they're making that happen. So the bubbles will rise and they'll kind of form these rings. When they stop moving and the zombies start to take over, those rings collapse. And so if you do this really well, you will get these thick, in a five gallon bucket, it's kind of hard, but in a 30 gallon drum, you'll get these thick, nice rings where it looks like, you know, like a frothy beer kind of thing of them frothing and making these rings on the top. Five gallon bucket, you just don't get as much effect. There's not as much population in there. But them going around frothing, making this movement, um, and you want to catch them on the peak while they're still moving, while it still smells sweet to you. Um, and you'll notice right now there's no smell really in it, but you know, and as the, the life grows, that's why I say your nose knows. Your nose is designed to detect biology. You know when something smells pilau, the biology that in there is incompatible for you as a human. So when you smell this and it's sweet, it means there's good microbes. You smell it, it's pilau, it means the zombies and the bad guys, like not bad guys, but guys you don't like are in there. Anaerobic, yeah, and those tend to be pathogens in our current understanding. And if I did put that into my eyeball, I'd get pink eye and shit. That's pretty gnarly. Can you recover if the thing goes to the uh, anaerobic state? Can you like put more potatoes in it? Um, no, no. So, so the question is, can can I recover it? If I go too far, if I go past, is it is it no good? The answer is, it's good now as a fertilizer. It's, it, so it's a food. It's, it's, it's no good and you cannot recover to bring it as a micro. So it's, it's not lost, but it's become, instead of putting microbes and putting leaders out, they're now dead body zombies. And, it, and it's like, you know, because I'm full of nutrients, right? And if I was dead and I, someone just whacked me, now I'm, now I'm a fertilizer bag. And so same thing, once you go too far, then I become just fertilizer. But you cannot, it's real hard to revive me from the dead, yeah? Or is he just like, oh, start over, make a new one? Same, same kind of idea here. So, so it's always one resource, whether it's fertilizer, you went too far, or it's microbes and you, you caught it on the rise up. 
Yeah, so for me here, what I recommend, I don't, I don't know what the paper says on there in terms of the days, but I really got it down to where it depends on your temperature. And I do this sometimes in black metal drums, 55 gallon drums, and it happens in about 20 hours. If I wait 30 hours, too long. If I do it in five gallon buckets, smaller batches, it sometimes takes two days. I'm at 650 feet. It takes me two days at a five gallon bucket. If I was up twice that elevation, even higher, it's probably gonna take a little bit longer. But that's where you gotta tune it in. You also gotta tune it into being like, okay, it was a nice sunny day today, it was a little bit warmer, or was it colder out? Because the microbes will react like that. If you are up in a too cold area, like, and by too cold, I mean like, when you go outside at night, you need like one, one hoodie, like where you're like, shoot, like, you know, um, put one hoodie around this. So take one insulated thing, one, one old sleeping bag and wrap it around. And if it's really, really cold, even, even consider putting in a, um, a fish aquarium heater. And then that way it'll stay warm and just like if, if you're at night and you're thinking man I wish I had a fire and I wish I had like blankets on me then your microbes probably is also wishing that so help them out and and make it that way and then they'll respond to you um, but like I said they're indigenous they're already from your area they're already used to sleeping outside in the cold it's just that they won't breed as fast when you're cold right you cold you, you think about you know yeah, if it's really cold, probably you thinking about that, but I don't know. No. <laughs> Depends. No. No. <laughs> Throw some sea salt no. inside. Hold that. No. <laughs> um, no. No. So this here, it's all about catching no. on the whale. No. Use it early, and you and it's you cannot really store it. That's why no. this ultra low cost way of showing you, you no. kind of gotta be on it and ready to use it. No. Because I cannot be like, okay, it's ready. Oh, well, I'll just spray in like five hours. It's more like know your area, know your time, know how long it takes there. Do a batch or two because it's not that expensive to just see how long it takes in your area. And then, then when you're ready to go spray this, you're ready. It's like, okay, I know in my area it takes 34 hours to be kind of like at this peak. So I'll set it this time before because I want to spray it in the afternoon this day. And once you got it calibrated that way, then you can make your batch, you know, just cook cook a bunch of potatoes while you're at it and then just, you know, put a few in and keep the other ones in the fridge and, you know, that way you're keeping energy efficient and all that. Um, and you can spray this um, weekly if you want. Um, anytime you're doing irrigation, you can add it. Um, and if you are doing this, the microbes, plus the food all the time, you're putting workers plus food out there, and that means less work for you to do. Because they're now going to work in your soil, they're, they're making your soil better, and they're well fed. Um, however, be careful on just spraying just the microbes without the food. Because they're gonna have to find that food someplace. Sometimes you're better off even just spraying the food, right? Because there's guys out in the soil you know, just like if you put food out, someone's gonna come by and eat it. Same thing, but if you put one person out, you know, people aren't gonna come, you know, different. Just food is, food is the, like, kind of starting point. So, so any questions on this simple Ina aid type of thing? Does that correspond to your paper and make sense from that perspective? Yeah. How would you use this if you if you are uh, pot gardening and you're not using big areas like if you have raised beds in boxes? Um, so t two two ways. Um, one is just as a, a drench. But I wouldn't change. Oh, so so the question the question is if you're just kind of doing pot gardening or raised raised beds, how how would you apply this? Because I'm talking like more like uh, industrial farm, but but. But same way, you can you can use this as a water drench, and it's really good to get these into the soil because there are soil microorganisms. But it's also if you put it on the plant surface, 
the plant can absorb through it eats through its upper plant too you know that's the, the stomata and all that stuff absorbs nutrients and these microbes also help to create like a layer of armor on your plant so when you get these good beneficial microbes taking space then a pathogen comes and lands the good guys are like oh hey welcome to the party here's some food and whatever and they neutralize that microbe versus if your plant is sterile and a bad guy lands it's like you're not home and you just can help yourself to their your thing right question so can you take stuff like a gallon of that and then start a new bucket or you have to keep gathering soil every time Gather yeah, soil each time and start start fresh each time. You should start fresh with soil every time. Yeah. So this this recipe right here, you don't wanna you don't wanna try to save or preserve this because every generation they go in here. I started talking about how you got soil guys and then they go aquatic. Oh. Every generation they're in here, they're aquatic and it's not it's you're divorcing them from their outside thing. So in here it takes 48 hours, 36 hours of growing. And then they're like, oh yeah, do you remember like 20 generations, because you put them into your soil, and they say to each other, oh, do you remember like 20 generations ago, grandpa talked about how we used to do soil, and oh yeah, you have some of his notes, and he started reading those, and then they can go back to the soil. And so you're taking this adaption from soil, aquatic breeding, and back to soil. And that's why this is ultra low cost, and there's, there's higher cost ways to do it where you keep them soil the entire way. But this ultra low cost of breeding in this aquatic is the cheapest way to breed them. So the longer you keep them in the aquatic, they're like, they're like, oh, do you remember 10,000 years ago when Grandpa did that? And the guy's like, I don't know, bro. The book's kind of, I, I don't know. The other thing you said, you have to add food, or it's better to add food when you spray that. The food would come from your diluted, uh, the other fertilizer you're talking about from diluted. Correct. So let's let's bring it let's bring it all back all together and let's say okay so now boom two days happen this has this nice bubbles in here I, I go and I smell it and I'm like oh it smells pretty good see it you know it doesn't smell like vomit or dead bodies or any you know rotten eggs it smells good it might smell a little sour like sourdough but that's not one bad smell so, sourdough is not one bad smell oh smell that like oh okay my ultra low cost microbes are ready. Now in this barrel right here, my ultra low cost balanced food is ready. Okay, right here is my 30 gallon trash can that I'm gonna go and use out on my land. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fill up my trash can that I'm gonna try target 30 gallons. So I fill it up about 25 gallons. I go, I take this here, which is now all my ultra low, low cost microbes. I run it through this filter as I'm pouring it into my diluted 20 gallon thing. So now I got 24 gallons of that in there. I'm like, all right, cool, good. Now I go take my gallon of the, the nutrients, pour those into this big barrel that I got here. Now I could, well, better yet I aerate it first. That's what I forget. So I'm able to take one step back get this flow 100% so we aerate this stuff too because you don't need to aerate the, the grass fertilizer but it helps so we're gonna take one step back just so we can do this in the way that's not even gross so come here make my 20 gallons put in my gallon of oh the, the grass fertilizer put my fish bubbler in there aerate that thing now I'll make this same recipe right here right now Now this thing is bubbling over here. My my um, my grass fertilizer is bubbling off. That's happening. Now I got my microbe set. Now I wait two days or a day and a half. This is now ready. This is bubbling. This smells good. Now I dump that in. So my food has already been bubbling in there. It's already off off gas. It's good. Now I'm dumping in my microbes. So now I got my microbes and my food in here. And the last thing is I can go. And I can say, okay, well, I got 30 gallons of water in here now. So that means I'm going to add, what, four sp or one spoon per gallon. So I'm going to add 30 spoonfuls of salt into there. So even though there was salt in this one, that was the microbes already ate that. I'm putting more salt in here because that salt is going to go feed my plants and go flocculate and make those chemical transformations out there. 
So now in this tank that I got ready, I covered my, my food for, for 24 hours. I added my heat microbes in and then I added more salt into this. So I got my entire trifecta, those three things in this. And now this tank is set and ready. And so I can either take that with a watering can and water my things, or I can load that into some sort of pump sprayer and pump spray everything that I need to. Or the, the way I prefer to do it is go get one, one of these and for any size thing, I don't like mess around, I get some two stroke Mariyama Japanese engineering power behind me and um, fire this guy up. So, and I, the reason the reason I bring this stuff here is this is like a um, it's kind of a more expensive equipment, but man, this thing like trying to do it other ways without bit of getting the right equipment, and you cannot. So if you're on a really big thing, I recommend getting one tractor sprayer, like one Venturi sprayer. But if you're on anything like the size of like an acre or two. Um, whatever like even this like if I was if someone does come and tell me oh try to take care of this orchard over here that I would definitely get one of these I wouldn't try to show up with a solo sprayer where I can put that on my back because you just yeah I'd show up once and be like okay I I, I gotta charge 100 bucks an hour now this is a Mariyama MS 75e and if you get it from Garden Exchange, tell them because I like them sponsor me. So, <laughs> um, but what this thing does is this is an input-output, and then it comes with a hose. And it's I just like add with these three recipes. You can do all of them separately. They don't have to be mixed in at the end. One day, like I, I do soil drain microbes. Another day, I feed them. Uh -huh. Another day, can do the seawater fish. But you can do it all on. Yeah. With your air raid, you said a fish bucket. We're talking about something you put in the aquarium. With an air stone on it. Wow, that could With existence. an air stone. Okay. Yeah. And how long do you air raid for? Uh, the, the stinky grass stuff, yeah. about 24 hours is good. Yeah, uh, tw 12 to 24 hours, somewhere in there. Yeah. 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 So once the, the food has been aerated 24 hours, you add the ultra low cost microbes at the very end before you use where you let them hang out. There. Yeah, you want to add the microbes right then. You don't really want to bubble these microbes here. Like notice this is a static thing and they're doing their own thing. They're they're aerobic in there. I don't need to bubble these guys. Um, so add them right when they're ready to go. Um, and so yeah, I just I just brought this piece of equipment because I just want to be like make things easy. What this enables me to do is I have my my 20 gallon my 30 gallon trash can right here. I drop these hoses in. This could be a 250 gallon tote. This could be a five gallon bucket. This could be like a liter jar if I really wanted to be done fast. Um, but I dropped this in. This is, but before I drop this in, I take my filter bag, which I don't know where that thing went. behind you. Okay. Well, the thing is camouflage these days. I would take all the dirt out of this thing, but what I do is I take this, I put it inside this, I tie it around with one string right here and then it's running through this filter bag so and I leave like you see all the hoses and like it's not at the bottom it's pulled up here so this whole bag filter so it doesn't get clogged on me and so instead of having to filter my whole tank I just filter right before it goes into my hose like this and this this bag this 220 micron filter is never clogged this thing okay. it's really nice as long as my knot is tight right here around this good to go and tying this thing on that's that's how i do it run this then this hose right here enables me to go in one huge circle this pretty much um well with this square the way it's set up i can basically do the radius from that 30 gallons with this no problem um and that's 30 gallons per about i'd say it's maybe a quarter acre coverage with just this hose here 
um, but it, it, but that's spraying it a bit strong. Um, usually I would spray about 15 gallons in a quarter acre or so. Um, but it all depends. Really what you're trying to do is get, when I'm foliar feeding, is I'm just trying to get the plant just misted wet. So like if you were there and I hit you, you'd just be like, just missed it. You wouldn't be dripping. You wouldn't be soaked. You're just kind of misted wet. And that's what enables the plants to uptake. But a lot of times I'm also then getting this into the soil. So I'll spray more because then I'm just hitting the soil around and I hit the plant and try to hit it from the bottom. So I'm getting on the underside of the leaves and getting my whole plant. But then I just hit the soil and just go and just keep the thing running. And basically what I try to do when I'm spraying is keep my feet moving. I know if my feet are moving that I'm spraying about the right application rate. If I ever stopped into spraying stuff, I'm probably over spraying. So that's that's how I roll and um, then when you spray that wood, you said foliar spray, will it have a scent to it when you spray on the trees? I not eat. too zombied out, not too gross. In those dilutions, no yeah, you should be fine. You, you should be fine. Um, that's the especially if you aerated it before. Um, however, however, I do not recommend getting this into your eyes and getting blowback into your eyes. Uh, you can't, like, and I, and I, in fact, I don't even advocate drinking it, but you can. I mean, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world that you ingest this because it's already there, but, but it's still, it's still really not a good idea. I make, I make other recipes in Korean natural farming you can drink and eat. And this is, this is like, only if you're a hardcore guy would you even try that. You know, it's like you really like impress your friends. Yeah, I eat everything I use, okay. And then, but then I finish it with lab, and you, maybe don't tell your friend about that, but you always put probiotics into your gut to cure that. So, anyway, I don't want to get too far off, but answer your questions. Yeah. I just one more question. Can you, can I spray my annuals, they're more tender plants, in my vegetable garden with this? It's yes. Not too strong. Um, so anything, anything that you think may, where you're concerned about, is it too strong? Head more towards that 1 to 100 dilution yeah. than in my more 1 to 10 dilution. And for each plant you're going to find it has a different how it lights things. Um, you know, tender things sometimes too much is too much. Um, but what, what I'm really like mostly talking trees don't like don't really worry about trees very much. Yeah. So just the question was if your system did get to the point where it was stinky and you spray that as a foliant spray, you mentioned about your indoctrinating kind of the zombie microbes that aren't as beneficial, would that be a detriment to this whole overall program? Uh, not uh, not necessarily. So so I always I always recommend that if you're ever worried about pathogens, which is what kind of I'm con saying the zombies are, are these pathogens, is you want a good batch of good microorganisms out there. So, so if you're ever worried about, okay, do I have pathogens present, if you make a sweet smelling batch of this and then spray it, it'll almost, it'll neutralize your problem within hours, if not minutes. Because the good microbes, they just don't tolerate the bad microbes, you know? It's, it's like, if there's a bunch of good people here and one thug starts coming by, like we deal with them, right? And it's same, same in the microorganism world. However, if it's a whole bunch of thugs that you're bringing, like you're inviting a bunch of like, like meth guys here or something to like do, it's like, you know, you're like, bro, I don't know if I should go to that spot. And the only way we could do it is to come in with hundreds of good people, like outnumber them 10 to one and then show them enough love and they, they don't need that kind of stuff, you know, like, and so that's what it's about. So anytime you smell it, it's pilau, like, Yes, you know it's about dilution and also about then coming in with good things. So, um, any other questions? You said that that's a two hose thing, and you have both hoses in the bag, the black hoses. Nope. So one hose, this hose here, is a uh, input. This hose here is a return. So if all the water is not coming out of my hose here, this this thing still wants to run because otherwise the pump will overheat. And so it runs a water cool thing, so you gotta keep it running. So this hose keeps the water running through the pump regardless and returns it back to the tank. 
So I put this one outside and then I have this one just in the tank and it returns the water and it goes through this system. Yeah, just another clarification. Are we really talking about this system, Drake, being more of a foliar spray system versus directly into the soil? It's both. Okay. It's both. Um, what I what I find is when you're doing when you are say say I'm opening up land I just I till my new garden bed I get it all primed and I want to now grow I will take a trash like I'll take a trash can that like 30 gallon trash can and don't drench it on there it meaning the soil so like if I did a garden bed the size of this tent right here I would dump about 30 gallons of, of that finished mixture with my micros, with my food, with my minerals in there, in this area to drench it to start. Because I've done a lot of soil work and I messed it up and I've done soil work. And I'd drench it and I'd, if ideally I'd drench it a couple times before I'm going to plant. <laughs> but now I'll say my plants are growing, it's a lot of work to lift 30 gallons of water into this area and do that. So what I do is then a much lighter dilution just to hit the plants because they're already established. I've already done some soil work with the microbes. And so there's a drench that you do heavy to start and then a light spray that you're kind of just touching everything up. And that could be applied to ground cover plants as well as trees and orchards, okay, go ahead. And where trees and orchards, you want to gather your microbes from there. Ground cover type plants, you grab your microbes from here. And think about which microbes you're putting in, right. what you're starting what with. What environment is it going to, got you. And, think, and then what kind of oh, the fertilizer you're going to use, think about what stage they're in. Do they need nitrogen? Are they, do they want meaty kind of stuff? Yeah. Are they growing just, you know, just maintenance growing? Are they going to use the grass? Are they fruiting? Are they going to use from the fruit? And so think about that, the type of food you're then going to feed. Depending on the cycle of the plant, the production cycle, right? Yeah. And so you can change the foods, you can change where you grab the micros from. The sea salt's almost always good. As long as you're diluting it 1 to 30, it's almost always a benefit. And a lot of times in farming, we'll have one trace nutrient that's tying everything else up. So just go get the ocean water, it has it all. The microbes will figure out how to disassemble and get it where it needs to go. It's the cheapest trace nutrient way. Awesome. Oh, good. Excellent presentation. Cool. Any, any other? other? Yeah. yeah, any other questions? Thank you, Greg. You're really yeah. good yeah. Uh, explaining things. Enough, enough science for not too mind boggling, Greg. Good job. <laughs> Is this a The zombies. You gotta yes. love that terminology. Yes. I got it. <laughs> got some power lifters in there, too. Well, you got it down. <laughs> I love your descriptions. That's how we retain information, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, um, so there is, um, if, if you have questions and you want to ask questions, I have a website, it's knfsupport.com, so knfsupport.com, and what that enables you to do is ask a question there, and then many people can weigh in, but the best answers go to the top, and I troll it pretty hard to make sure that I'm always getting good answers there, so. And inaid.com is also your site? Yeah, that'll take you to these recipes plus videos on how to do the same stuff. Okay, so they're both hand in hand, two sites. Uh, one, one is, well, one you'll find INAID redirects you to naturalfarminghawaii.net, which is a great, wonderful, big website with like tons of stuff. But INAID takes you to one specific page, which are these recipes with videos on there. Um, but feel free if you want to take a go down a big rabbit hole, go to naturalfarminghawaii.net and just start going through. Cause well, thank you. Thank, thank you for your presentation. Yeah, thank you. It.